when I'm there to because I'm gonna be very stressed. And I gotta move around so there's no problem. Okay. Erase it. Yeah, yeah. One degree. Because it wasn't warm enough. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yes. excuse me, yes, yes. Uh, sure. a warning from uh, from Anna. So some of you have asked how we will organize the visit this afternoon. So we will give detailed instructions after lunch, okay? Uh, basically we'll be going all together in the bus to the Sagrada Familia and then back to the uh, Okay. So the bus is just over there. So it's over there. Yes, 20 meters from here. Okay. Then we should go our bike. Okay. So our next speaker, speaker is uh, David Belan from United Kingdom Tour. Hello. Uh, he's going to talk about another aspect of uh, addiction and sad disease. That is the disease. Uh, right. Thank you, Rafael. Did you mind to fix the light off? Sure. <laughs> so um, I'll try to lead you through uh, what we've been doing for the last five years, trying to figure out from the transition from impulsivity to compulsivity, whether this, transi this transition came from transitions at the neurological level, and whether we could find also transitions at the psychological level that went alongside uh, this uh, development of drug addiction. So uh, I'll start by acknowledging the people I'm working with, because I'm always stressed by the end of my talk, and I always forget it. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank Jeff. Uh, the two postdocs I've co-supervised with Jeff and Barry Everett in Cambridge, Morgan Bess and Jennifer Murray. Jean-Luc Cueto is a neurologist in Poitiers, where I used to have my lab, with whom I've worked a lot. And all the postdocs and PhD students on my lab Aude Belarossan, Eric Ducré, Jean-Yves Roger, Marie Lardeniel, Nathalie Marine, Jérôme Lacos, Michael Co, Maxime Fussac, and my mentor, by Everett. I would like to thank Raphael for inviting me here for the second time. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I hope you'll uh, share my answer with Adam. Uh, the research I'm going to present you has been funded by the INSEAN, the AXA Research Fund, Fondation pour la Recherche Médicale, Fondation FICEM, and the French Agence Nationale de la Recherche. My take-home message today would be, if you are interested in neuropsychotic disorders, it's very fancy to do autogenetics. It's very fancy to do hardcore molecular biology. But it has to start with a good behavior. And I think the most powerful technological tool in the field of neuropsychiatry is behavior. You have to make sure that what you're measuring is exactly what you claim you're measuring. And uh, we're going to discuss, hopefully, several wisdoms that are currently shaping the field of drug addiction. The first one being factors that subserve an increased propensity to engage in drug self-administration also contribute to the switch to addiction. We've discussed about self-medication, the choice you people might make to use one drug over another. Is it really something that has to do with the transition to addiction? Obviously, it is comorbid. It goes alongside addiction. But is it something that is carried over with drug use, or is it a contributing factor to the transition from drug use to drug addiction? Uh, we'll also discuss about this wisdom that drug addiction stems from drug-induced enhanced plasticity and facilitation of habit formation. Is it really the case? We're going to discuss a lot about habits, but unfortunately, by the end of this talk, we'll see that habits have little to do with addiction, perhaps. we we'll discuss about that. Um, this is something very important. It is currently acknowledged that compulsive drug use and compulsive relapse, uh, and actually they, they depend upon craving, and they depend upon the prolambic occurrence pathway. And this is something I would strongly argue against. And I hope I give you enough information to support my claim. And also that relapse is an explicit process that necessarily follows a craving stage against which the addict would fight and eventually, because of a failed inhibitory control, would lose uh, the fight over. So, to start with, addiction is not a mere, a mere drug-taking problem. Uh, I know we've moved on to the DSM-5. Um, I think the DSM-5 have been designed to create an epidemic, an epidemic of drug addiction, because you need less criteria, and you put craving into this criteria, and craving is obviously the main behavioral feature of the display. Uh, so I stick with my DSM-4 for now. Uh, initially, in the DSM-3, addiction was defined by 
tolerance and withdrawal, which are pharma <coughs> pharmacological adaptations to drugs, or neurological adaptations to drugs, which play a role in the transition to compulsivity. I'm not, I'm not sure they are the core mechanisms that drive compulsivity. And then, in the dsm 4 r or 4, you ended up with five measures of compulsivity, which are the substances used in larger amounts or over longer per periods than initially attended, and there's a persistent desire or one or more unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control substance use, uh, the patients show a great motivation for the drug in that they give up social life and they would go for the forage for the drug. And importantly, these people would maintain drug use despite the awareness that drug use drives them you know, towards uh, illness or whatever, or losing their, <coughs> their lives. So they maintain drug use despite adverse consequences. So overall, you could say in, the, in, in this feature, there, there's an obsession feature, which is this craving, the persistent desire, this preoccupation the patients would, would display, and this obsession has to do with drug seeking. The drug addicts spend most of their time foraging for the drug, and they, they would spend proportionally little of their time taking the drugs, but then they would take more time to recover from the drug taking behavior. And we are uh, actually following up Trevor Robinson by Rebrit, you know initial statements, uh, we believe this is the compulsive addict feature of drug addiction. So uh, while uh, drug addiction, as Jeff very well introduced, goes from the initiation of drug use that can be supported by different factors, through seeking, risk seeking, sensation seeking, self-medication, so you would have a specific motivation for engaging into drug use, then this in, from this initiation stage, you would switch to recreational drug use. Actually, um, all of us do take some drugs sometimes. Coffee is a drug, it's a psychostimulant. Uh, so that's recreational drug use, no really big harm there. And then you would progressively switch in some patients from, or some people from recreational drug use to habitual compulsive drug use. And then this is where addiction is all about. From the cycles between habitual compulsive drug use and relapse, abstinence and relapse, and so on and so on. And this is what we are kind of interested in. And uh, we think that you, you can tackle these questions, both psychologically and neurobiologically, by investigating behaviors that are the operationalization of the DSM criteria, such as high motivation for the drug, as you could measure in a positive ratio of drug enforcement, not necessarily the classical procedure which are secular enforcement, we can discuss about that later. Loss of control over drug intake, which is classically measured by this increase in drug intake over time, provided you, the animals are given excellent access to the drug. And I hope I'll show you that excellent access to cocaine cycle expression and associated escalation to drug use has not much to do with compulsivity. Maintain drug use despite adverse consequences, which is a major feature of compulsive drug use, and I'll, I'll put a large emphasis on this aspect in my talk, and to control drug seeking habits, which is what I'm going to focus right now. As Jeff initially mentioned, Kubel Lemoyne has suggested that the development of drug addiction goes from impulsivity to compulsivity. And we have suggested that actually this is paralleled by a transition from goal directed behavior in your overall population. You will take drugs because you have a motivation for taking them. And once you switch from good rapid behavior to recursion drug use or chronic drug use, then these drug induced adaptations take place in your brain, such as incentive sensitization. Drug related CSAs become more important to you. And open and processes, actually, the drugs recruit these between system adaptations in your brain and including the stress system. And this contributes to the increased motivation towards drug seeking on the withdrawal. But altogether, they go alongside also a switch in the psychological processes that subserve the instrumental response itself, the behavior itself, which goes from goal-directed behavior to habits. And I try to emphasize today that addiction is not a disease of habits. Habits are adaptive. It's a disease of maladaptive habits. And these maladaptive habits are, according to us, 
an aberrant bridge between impulses and motivations that are related to these Pavlovian mechanisms, let's say, insensitive sensation and open processes, such that stimuli in the environment are embedded with very strong motivation, whether they are appetitive or aversive related to withdrawal. And there's actually they are linked directly to the habit system, such that an impulse becomes translated into an action without explicit awareness. And we believe that this, what we've called incentive habits, are a necessary step towards compulsivity. They are not compulsivity already, because to express compulsivity, you have to fail to inhibit these processes. And this is related to what Jeff already mentioned about you know, this failure in top-down executive control from the corporate. So let's go back to the classical conditioning. Like any behavior, when you take drug, you take drug with cues around you. And these cues, through as repeated associations, become embedded with the sensory properties of the drug and the motivational properties of the drug. They become conditioned stimuli. And drug addiction has to do a lot with how conditioned stimuli can trigger or maintain sequences of behavior that lead to uh, drug seeking and taking behavior. And Childress, for a long time ago, has shown that drug addicts presented with these conditioned stimuli display in functional imaging studies activation of the limbic system. The amygdala, the orbital cortex, the insular cortex, the pancreatic neurons firing as well. So these conditioned stimuli trigger an emotional state that has been related in human studies to craving. But this is something I wanted to show you. This person has been stopped uh, driving uh, drunk and is asked to blow into this machine to measure his alcohol levels. Okay, I'm going to replay it. So he was drunk, he drove, he's been asked by the police to be checked his alcohol levels, and unfortunately, it looks, it looks to me like a bottle. And this person does this. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone here tell me that there was craving before? I'm not even sure there was craving here. It looks like a reflex behavior. This is what it is all about. Actually, when we discuss about habits here, I'm not discussing about skills. I'm not discussing about how well you can perform a behavior. I'm discussing about the psychological processes that support the initiation of an action. And this is and the environment, the proximity of looks, what looks like a bottle, that triggers a specific behavior, and obviously maladaptive. <laughs> so now, if you put this picture alongside the very nice results from Noah's lab that I've shown, not even 10 years ago, uh, that drug addicts in a PET scan like this, presented with cocaine-related stimuli, display craving, and alongside craving, there's a massive increase in dopamine transmission, not in necessarily in the ventral cerebrum, but in the more dorsal parts of the cerebrum. This part of the cerebrum that has nothing to do with motivation, supposedly, that has to do with skills, habits, motor control. And Nora just showed it that study that the increase of pain transmission into the dorsal cerebrum was related to the magnitude of craving. That's beautiful. The mesonabic system has nothing to do with motivation and craving in drug addiction. I'm not really sure. And I would like to challenge this, considering that if you're in a PET scan like this, you're presented with stimuli, but there's no drug in the vicinity. There's no drug you can take. I would suggest that what you measure here is the cellular signature of the initiation of a habit response and stimulus response process that you could not fulfill behaviorally because there's no drug around. And obviously, if there's no drug around, there's addicts, onks, you know, crazy people, there's a feedback to thermocortical loops that something is mismatch between the behavior that has just been implemented and the environment. And there's a post-hoc understanding that you know, the drug is not here. And the consequence of this post-hoc understanding is craving. So one prediction would be that if you were to give these people cocaine in the PET scan, you would have this increased pain transmission, but you would have no craving. And they would take the drug. And craving would be, in that case, a postdoc understanding of a failed stimulus response process because of the absence of the drug in the vicinity. So addiction, perhaps, they are beyond reward, for sure. 
And would they be beyond actions, actions being goal-directed behavior? So this is exactly what I told you about, and this is the model. I'm very sorry, because uh, the, the screen has shrinked, so it's not really clear. The current models on which are based most of the behavioral therapies, and the models of addiction and relapse, are that extraceptive stimuli, CSEs in the environment, or interoceptive stimuli through incentive learning can either, within the explicit level, so what you're aware of, drive a need that is translated into, into an aberrant motivation, and because your prefrontal cortex is damaged, somehow the inhibitory processes can't stop this motivation from being translated into craving, and you would actually seek drugs to cope with this craving. And you're fully aware of everything here. This is a goal-directed relapse that actually happens all the time. But an alternative view would be that in drug addicts, the explicit level is somehow shifted. And what used to be pressures within the explicit level could be now driven through the non-explicit level, such that incentive learning would do not lead to needs, but it would be translated into drive, urges or impulses that you're not necessarily aware of, that would directly lead to drug-taking habits. And if the drug is not there, then a post-hoc understanding would turn these urges that are not explicit into aberrant motivation, which is explicit. And obviously, because your prefrontal cortex is failing, you would nevertheless crave. Can we test whether both psychosis are true? I think both are true, and I think both occur in every single drug addict, depending on the context. An example would be, I'm a drug addict. I'm very happy. I have maintained self-abstinence for three years, and I just received a Nobel Prize. Don't go into no psych psychoanalysis now. <laughs> and I want to celebrate it, so I go with my people in my lab, and we have a drink, and I relapse. I would believe this is exactly this. You know, I wanted to drink because I wanted to celebrate and I was in the mood. But now, I've spent all my life expecting a Nobel Prize and I turn out being 75 and I've been abstinent for 30 years, I'm glad. And that day, my worst enemy gets the Nobel Prize. I go back home and I drink my bottle of whiskey. I think this is more like this. And you would go from positive urges on the, or the aversive aspect of neuroticism in that case. So, now if we look into the psychological processes involved in drug seeking and taking, and we focus on habits. So drug use is relatively fast and efficient. <coughs> Actually, if you ask me to sell for Mr. Heroin right now, I just can't know how to do it. I, I, I don't know how to do it, I couldn't do it. If you ask me to smoke, even if I have never smoked, I could. Because I know how to smoke, because I know it's part of my world. And it's perhaps one of the reasons why nicotine is that much addictive. It's because before we've ever experienced the pharmaceutical properties of the drug, we know how to consume it. We have implemented all the behavioral repertoire that has to do with using it. Anyway, habits are readily enabled by particular stimuli configurations. They're initiated and completed with uh, attention. They are difficult to impede in the presence of triggering stimuli. And they're effortless and acted in the absence of awareness. Not all the time, mind you, but they can be. And actually, th these features much prefer to the definition of habits uh, given by Tiffany in 1990. So once again, <coughs> habits here have nothing to do with lacing shoes or grabbing a bicycle or whatever. It's not about skills that much. It's about the psychological processes that trigger the behavior. So do you think like any day life example of habits? So, our scientists to try quite a lot. It must have happened to you that you end up, you know, in this hotel room. It's now it's, it's 11 p.m. You've been you've been flying for 12 hours. You open the door. And what do you do? Because it's there. So you switch on the light, and the bug breaks. You get a shower. You go to your dinner, a very important dinner. You don't drink much, so you're not drunk. You come back. What do you do? You open the door and. You don't want to switch off the light because you know the light is broken. You just press the switch. That's a habit. 
It's dark, you open the door, you go there. You don't have to think about it. And when you say, ah, yeah, obviously you are remembering that the light is broken, but actually you, don't, you didn't forget it. It's just you realize that there's a mismatch between what you just did and what just happened. Okay, this is a habit. And this is purely adaptive, because if we had to think about every single little thing we had to do in life, I couldn't be able to speak right now. Because actually what's applied to the external world could be applied to the internal world. So habit can be considered in the psychic brain as homeostasis. So if, I, if I am thinking right now to control all my muscles, not to go to the loo right now or whatever, I couldn't, I couldn't behave. And habits are here to free your mind to do something else. So this is to say that in a goal-directed behavior, you have an initial motivation, and you can implement subroutines that are habitual, OK? Within an overarching goal-directed behavior, you can implement habits, which are skills in that case. And in a habitual general process, you can implement action, action outcome subroutines. Drug addicts aren't that rigid. If the dealer is not here, they're not going to die there waiting for the dealer. They are going to implement something that is more adaptive, and they'll find a new dealer somewhere else. Nevertheless, it doesn't tell you anything about what drove them initially towards the dealer. And what drove them could be a stimulus response process. And within this overarching higher cognition process, they can implement flexible behaviors. So habits have nothing to do much with performance. It's more about the initiation of actions. I hope I make this case strong now, and we can move on. If you have any questions, just ask me. So, so I think a lot of clinicians have a, a bit of a hard time with this concept. So I'll just throw that in there and see what, what kind of discussion we can have. Because if you look at the flexibility, of, you know, it used to be, what's the cure for addiction clinically? You send people off for 28 days, they pay 40,000 bucks, and they cured, right? And so the amount of flexibility in behavior that you see when people thrown into totally new environments where they have really no habits to fall back on, that they still are able to display in order to seek out drug and relapse is amazing to most yeah. clinicians. And in fact, it's amazing to the patients themselves. So I think a lot of clinicians have a hard time reconciling that flexibility, creativity, and, and sort of broad repertoire of behavior with this concept of a narrowing repertoire and a more automatic st stimulus. I am not to agree. Pattern. So it means that your, your addicts, when they leave the clinic, they want to relapse. What's that? So it means that because they are so flexible, and they spend three weeks there not expressing their habits, they are cured, they leave, they want to relapse. So the, the essence of habits is it's stimulus bound. Right. So obviously, when you when you when they express plasticity, flexibility yeah. in an environment that is divorced from the actual stimuli to which the habits are bound, they would be actually they would behave completely differently. But how does it treat the bond between this stimuli and their behavior, keeping them remote from their life, keeping them remote from the stimuli, the very stimuli that drive the behavior? If actually, I, I, would, I would like to believe it, but in that case, you give them three weeks, they leave the clinic, and they never relapse. So that's the dilemma, and, and still they do. And they relapse at very similar rates to if you clean them up and send them out on the street right away, right? It's about 67% yeah. in a year. So uh, I, uh, it's hard for clinicians, I think. I agree, and I think it's hard for clinicians because most of the strategies are based on strengthening the inhibitory control. Yep. And we'll go through the notion of incentive habits. If, let's say, if there's a big difference between not being able to inhibit the impulses you're aware of and not seeing the impulses that drive your behavior. And part of the addicts, you can easily play with a restoration of the inhibitory control. And you would have positive you know, long-term effects on them. But those were most driven by non-explicit urges. How do you address them with the current strategies? You just can't. So you can play with all the representations they have of the causal manipulations in the environment. But if they are not aware of the urges that drive their behavior, you have no access as a clinician to this feature 
And I think, uh, I hope one of the conclusions of the talk would be a new evolution into CVTs would be to make addicts much more aware of the, their internal urges, the, some of the urges they are not aware of, broaden their insight. So that most of the impulses become within the uh, awareness. And then the actual CVT strategies could help tackling these ones. But I think right now, you're just tipping the top of the iceberg. So that is actually in place. So you know, Marlat's whole concept of relapse prevention therapy, a lot, and I've you know, I've done those groups. I've trained people to do them. A big part of that is teaching the patients to recognize if they're not aware of the internal processes, at least you can make them aware of what kind of behavioral sequence that corresponds to what's going on inside. So we can teach patients to to sort of recognize those processes to develop new behavior strategies that don't lead up to relapse, it does have measurable effects. So that's relapse prevention therapy for you. It's, it's a form of CBT, and the effect sizes are this much, right? Uh, so there's a lot going on. Yeah. This is part of it, I guess. So I, I, I hope you'll be more convinced. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so overall, habits are inflexible. They are not sensitive to manipulations of the representation of the motivational value of the outcome. And we'll go back to that later on. And they are neither sensitivity, sensitive to manipulations of the representation of the causal relationship between the incentive response and the outcome. So how to play with this? You can play with outcome devaluation procedures. So you make the outcome less appealing, and you measure under extinction whether the animal would still forage for the outcome. And here, you make the instrumental response less appealing by giving the outcome without any instrumental responding. And because rats are like us, they are lazy, if they can get the outcome without working, they are not going to work. So you change the representation, the representation the animal has of the causal relationship between these actions and the environment. So you can probe these two mechanisms. Very interestingly, Peter Holland has shown that habits are more sensitive to power gain influences than goal-directed actions. Which is surprising somehow, because you would say habits, this is a not explicit behavioral reflex. How can it be controlled by motivational properties of CFCs more than an ongoing goal-directed action that requires that you're fully aware of everything in the environment to drive your behavior? We'll go back to this a little bit later. And interestingly, and this fits very well, with uh, George Coop and Michel Lumos' uh, hypothesis. Habits are triggered and facilitated by stress. It's been shown in special navigation. It's been shown in many, many different behaviors. Stress facilitates habits, and it has evolutionary interest. We can discuss about that a bit later. But the point is, if drugs trigger the stress system, they are bound somehow to facilitate habits. The pity is, there are very nice and interesting studies in you know, out there showing that behavioral sensitization to cocaine facilitates habit for food. What I'm interested in, habit for drug, in a drug addict, I don't really care about how habitual the behavior of drug addict is towards food. Because you know, if, they were, if they had strengthened habits towards food, it would be easier to treat them. Um, <coughs> anyway, so, and habits are dependent upon the dose of their sodium. And interestingly, a study from uh, Rui Costa Lab has shown that um, if you stress rats as compared to the control group, and you train these animals in a ratio ratio schedule of enforcement for food, uh, actually they would acquire the behavior to the same rate. So they don't differ behaviorally there. But then if you test them early on or later on as to whether these liver processes here are co directed or habitual, so you perform a devaluation procedure. There are two ways of performing a devaluation procedure. If the animals are food restricted to work in this task, and they work for food pellets, one day before the task, you give them their food of food pellets. Okay. They are not hungry anymore. And like, you know, when you pass a pizzeria and you're hungry, you really like the smell. After a big meal, you don't really like the smell. So you do exactly the same thing. Just you society them. And they, they are not they're supposed not to be working anymore for the food. Or you would in, induce a lith lithium chloride induced malaise in these animals after the sessions so that the rat 
that contract would associate this illness with what they just ate. And after this procedure, you challenge the animals under extinction because you don't want them to try the food. You want them to tell you whether they work according to the representation they have of what they're working for. And you check whether they continue working or they stop working, right? Interestingly, early on, the guys who've been controlled, actually the control guys, they show marked sensitivity to the evaluation. They stop working if the food is not good the day before under extension. So they tell you, you I'm not going to work today for something I ate yesterday that made me ill, even though I'm not eating it. I know I don't like it. And the stressed guys, they're not sensitive to the evaluation. They maintain responding. And actually, it's not a failure in this procedure, because if you uh, perform the same kind of tests subsequently, it's the same thing. So the control guys maintain good active behavior over time. So the same behavioral performance can be supported by two different psychological processes. Interestingly, if you look at the striatum and dendrites, actually, in the stress group, there's a decrease in the number of dendrites and, they are, uh, it, and it's relative to their distance to soma. And in, there's an increase in the number of dendrites in the dorsal atherosphere. So the dorsal midostradon that plays alongside the ventral atherosphere to promote goal-directed behavior in control rats as antennas spread like this. And in stress rats, the antennas shrink. And it's the opposite feature in the dorsal atherosphere. Habit-based behavior has to do with plasticity taking place in the dorsal atherosphere at the detriment of the dorsal midosphere. Okay? So now, let's go back to addiction. And I think we kind of lost in translation there. We've been thinking for years into looking at that through this. And I'm afraid this doesn't really look like that much. And actually, we've been lost because we really want to follow face validity. You know, a rat does self and cocaine. Addicts self and cocaine. Addicts are addicts. A rat is addicted. I'm afraid it goes beyond that point. This is uh, a rat self and cocaine in my former lab. Obviously, the animal is activated. It's in the box. It's pressing now the left lever. And with cocaine, they turn around quite a lot. <coughs> And it does kind of, kind of couple of stereotypes with its head, so it's already had cocaine. This is a fixed ratio five shader of enforcement, whereby after five liver presses, the animal has received its first shot. And it's gonna go soon there. Come on. Hi. Go, go, go. And actually, that's all the animal does for two hours, okay? It presses. This is the cocaine associated CS the animal is being delivered cocaine right now. This is the goat from the drug addiction, that's beautiful. This is a model of a rat taking cocaine. Does it tell us anything about drug addiction? No. Nothing at all. It tells us what happens neurobiologically when a rat self-administers cocaine. You must, perhaps, not all of you must, have already drunk a glass of alcohol somehow your brain has been changed. So now, if I was to compare your brain to, to the one of someone who's never drunk alcohol, would I claim that your brain is the brain of an alcoholic? That's the same thing here. It's the same, the same difference. This is a rat sequencing cocaine. And interestingly, I don't even know why this rat is pressing. So you tell me, okay, you know, this is a tiny box, there are two levers, it's got nothing else to do. So why would I press? Then psychologically, is this behavior goal-directed or is this behavior habitual? This would be your first major difference psychologically and it would give us an insight into what happens. The key point here is that under fixed ratio schedules of enforcement, whereby after a certain amount of instrumental responding, the animal receives the drug, you can't really measure drug-seeking behavior, can you? Because you know, it would take the animal 10 seconds to get this first shot. And then there's cocaine on the board. Then what you measure is a behavior that is enhanced or kind of switched 
by cocaine, but it's not a pure drug-seeking behavior that would observe in people that would uh, steal grandma to get a couple of dollars and go back to the supermarket and steal a bottle of alcohol. She does a lot about her rating there. You can't access these processes with a fixed ratio sugar reinforcement here. Wait, I've been working all my life with it, so I'm not disregarding it. But that's important to keep in mind that there are major limitations there. So let's go back to the right world. From my right in this box, he knows that if he presses the left lever, he can, he can get access to cocaine. Interesting that at the same time, I have decided that every single time he would use cocaine, he would also be exposed to a few light. And through repeated associations, this Q light becomes full of the motivational value of cocaine. This is Pavlovian conditioning. But we have to keep in mind that Pavlovian conditioning and instrumental conditioning are aren't differential processes. They interact a lot. And actually, they interact in two ways, which is Pavlovian instrumental interactions. Can you give me two examples of Pavlovian instrumental interactions? Have you learned of PIT? Yeah. PIT, yeah. right? And what would be the other one? Conditional What's the difference between these two? The nature of the uh, uh, sound is a bit I'm not sure. The difference between PIT and conditional enforcement is the magnitude of the behavior and the magnitude of the effect. To measure PIT, you would have extinguished the animals for days before, such that the baseline of it is very low. <coughs> And when you present non-contingently the CS, the en enhancement of responding doesn't last for ages. And the animals don't go for two liver presses to 200. They go from two to 15 for 30 seconds, and then they go down. This is an acute burst of responding, which could be enough to trigger something else. Condition reinforcement that you can measure in the acquisition of a new response procedure, whereby a rat that has been put in this context to press for this would eventually learn to press for this without the drug. Okay, because the, the light is a reinforcer per se now. Or, on the second order schedule of reinforcement, whereby the animal would press and would receive contingently upon X liver presses the CS. And then the CS acts as a condition reinforcer. And we're going to discuss about that a little later. So, yeah? Yeah, that's really good. Um, it depends how long before they receive the drug you present the lab. Like in any experimental psychology experiment, the CS has to come alongside the US. Now, when they press the lever, there are almost six seconds between the lever press and the really cooking hit. So if you were to present the CS, prior to liver press. Within a five seconds range, it would be within 10 seconds range, the animal could detect the contingency and attribute motivation value to the CS. If you're before that, you might not get the effect. And actually what you would get is a stronger effect of the box of the occasion setter over the segment cues. Right? Yeah. When, when, uh, reinforce the, the idea of seeking behavior is the dose response effect of any drug. Absolutely. So uh, look at uh, cocaine, one milligram per kilogram, uh, 20 injections, uh, two milligram per kilogram, 10 injections. Absolutely. 0.5, 40. So it's... Uh, but this uh, is... Uh, in spite of the, of the relevance of the condition of stimulus, for sure, but there is some seeking behavior. Of course. But this is driven by the unit dose of the drug. And interestingly, if you were to do the same thing on the extended access, you wouldn't have exactly the same shift no. in titration. Yes. So now, why is this rat pressing? Either he comes to the box and you know he's going to have cocaine, and we can discuss about representation in rats later on, but they do have a representation. I don't know what they're, it's like, but they do have a representation. So I'm thinking about cocaine, and then I go and I give a price. Or this context and the associated CSs drive me towards liver pressing with or without cocaine. So there's a 
completely dissociation between the action of the animals and the potential outcomes. So it's interesting, it's been shown that all drugs facilitate habit-based behavior. But a very interesting study by uh, Corbett and Pat Janak uh, showed that alcohol exposure facilitates alcohol-associated habits, that is, uh, to a greater extent, uh, as it is for sucrose. For rats have been trained for short-term exposure, and with alcohol, they, they show a sensitivity to the evaluation. And in that case, they were given alcohol prior to the session. And after eight weeks of, of training, they don't show the sensitivity to the evaluation, so the behavior has become a bit old. Whereas for sucrose, even after eight weeks, they will still display the sensitivity to the evaluation. So overall, if you look at the time course of the accumulation with alcohol, after one or two weeks, alcohol-seeking behavior is, that, is goal-directed. But after extended training, four to eight weeks, it becomes 100% habitual. So there's a shift in the psychological processes that support the same <coughs> response with drug exposure. And this shift occurs faster than it does for natural rewards. First clue, interesting. Then we come with self administered drugs. All the question with the evaluation procedures has to do with ingestive behaviors. Either you pre-feed the animal or you induce a gastric malaise. How do you pre-feed an animal with cocaine? You give him cocaine, then you would have a decreased neuron threshold of titration. It's like playing with antagonists. There's no affective way to devalue cocaine. And actually, Zapata, in uh, Tony Schippendorf's lab, did an experiment I wish I had done. And we've discussed about that too long. We should have done it. Uh, they used a seeking, taking, change schedule of enforcement to probe uh, this question. So in this kind of task, the animal crosses one lever, a new palm, either a certain amount of time or a certain amount of responses, it actually gets access to another lever, a single lever press on which gives access to cocaine. Okay? And actually, the animal press the first lever to get access to the second one. So instead of devalu actually playing with the devaluation of cocaine, you could consider that extinguishing this lever is the same thing as the devaluation of the lever itself, right? The lever doesn't give access to cocaine anymore. Does it mean something, especially with regards to the instrumental responses on the first lever? And they showed that in rats, self administering cocaine for 15, 20 days, if you extinguish the taking lever, they drop dramatically. So this is non-extinguished, this is extinguished, the behavior Cooking self inspiration after 20 days is goal directed. So if there are changes in the contingencies in the environment, the animals just stop. So, you know, 20 days, that's already almost twice as much as what 90% of the labs worldwide would do in terms of self administration. But now, they went for 45 days of self administration. And performing the same procedure, the animals resist to the extension of the taking lever. Their drug-seeking behavior is not related anymore whatsoever to its consequences, because they press the seeking lever never to get access to cocaine. The behavior is inflexible, it's become a little. Okay? Interestingly, Ingo Villum, in Philip's lab, has shown that when the behavior is it actually, when the animals have been trained for protracted cooking self-administration, if you look at with voltammetry, fast dopamine signaling in the dorsal atherosclerum, after a week, there's no signal in this structure. After two weeks, there's a signal emerging that is maintained after three weeks. And interestingly, if you perform a unilateral lesion of the core of the mucous circumference, actually, while on the control lateral side of the dorsal atherosclerum, there's still the signal, you lose it in the ventral sphere, in the, in the con control lateral side, suggesting that when the behavior becomes habitual and dependent upon the dorsal sphere, the dopamine transmission there is under the control of the core. So there is an antecedent process taking place in the core to drive these dopamine processes in the dorsal sphere. 
Interestingly, this study, which is very recent, is a follow-up of a series of studies we've done with Barry Everett and Barry did before me in Cambridge. And it all actually started from this picture Jeff has already showed you, which is neurobiologically, drug exposure in monkeys, which are in humans, triggers adaptations that are restricted to the more landed parts of the cortical structure. circuitry. And after extended exposure, I'm not taking about habits or addiction now, after chronic cooking exposure, these adaptations spread towards the more sensory motor associative and cognitive areas of the cortical cellular circuitry. Okay? And this has been shown in monkeys in several studies, but Morgan Besson, who worked with Jeff and I, has also showed in rats using in situ hybridization to probe D2 mRNAs that. After 10 days of cooking self administration, there's a decrease in D2 mRNAs restricted to the shell of the nucleus accumbens. And after 50 days of cooking self administration, a kind of heroic experiment, these decreases spread to the entire cell. So, indeed, these adaptations take place in all the animals that have been tested to self administer cooking. Barry and Trevor Robbins initially suggested that this ventral to dorsal striatal shift of recruitment over time after cooking self-administration had to depend upon anatomical substrate. There has to be a high way whereby adaptations can spread. The Alexander and Kutcher model of the cortical cellular circuitry would tell you there are five loops originating from different regions of the, front of the cortex purely parallel and interconnected only through cortico-cortical interactions. Which was not that relevant to us, because it would suggest that the cortex drives the infrastructure shifts. Linda Porino has shown that indeed, at the same time as you can observe infrastructure shifts, you can observe shifts in the frontal cortex as well. But it seems the shifts in the frontal cortex are not preceding the shifts in the strata. And Susan Haber, in 2000, followed up by Ikemoto at my in 2007, have shown that actually this Alexander and Kutcher model is good, but can't, it cannot really account for the fact that some emotions can drive the behavior without explicit awareness, hijacking the, front, the frontal cortex or the cortex. And Susan Haber described this <coughs> anatomical structure whereby making spiny neurons in the shell that are innervated by neurons, dopaminergic neurons of the VTA, project back to the same neurons, but they also project back to more lateral neurons in the VTA, which themselves project to more lateral neurons in the core, and so on, such that dopaminergic or glutamatergic mechanisms in the shell can turn out to potentially be able to control dopaminergic processes in more lateral areas, perhaps up to the dorsal tertiary. Okay? So, to probe whether indeed we could manipulate this analytical structure, we had to use a model that allows us to measure cooking seeking behavior, making sure that it is habitual, that it is under the control of stimuli in the environment more than it was in by the drug, and that lasts for a period of time long enough so that we could contrast the behavioral effects of our manipulation. Right? And actually, the second of the schedule of enforcement model is the perfect model for this. Uh, it allows to dissociate seeking responses from taking responses in time, such so that the animal would press a lever for a certain amount of time. But regardless what they do, they would receive cocaine only provided they press the lever after a fixed interval of time has elapsed. So if we set this interval to 15 minutes, the animal could do for 15 minutes. Wait, press once, and get this shot. <coughs> but they don't do it. They, they ha do have anticipatory responses, like we would. We are actually, we are not you know, molecular cops. So when they know the drug is about to come, they, this urge, these impulses you know, are there, and they start seeking the drug. And interestingly, there's no relationship between what they do and what they get, because whatever they do, May they press two, seven times, or three times, 
they only would receive the drug, provided after these 15 minutes have elapsed, they request it once. So there's a pure and complete dissociation between actions and outcomes there, okay? On top of that, what we do is every 10 liver presses during this 15 minutes interval, the animals are presented with the contingent presentation of the CS. Okay? Sorry? You see. So it's very difficult to extinguish this behavior. I, I'm, going, I'm just going to show you the results. Uh, actually, this is what it looks like. So that's the courtesy of Dyna. Uh, so this animal here, look how preoccupied the rat is by the CS. This rat is going to press 425 times in 15 minutes for life, not for drug. Because it would press only once after this 15 minutes I have allowed to get the drug. So you tell me, yeah, no, that's a rat. We wouldn't do it. We do the same thing. Dogs do the same thing. Monkeys do the same thing. It's, it's all about anticipatory responses, seeking responses. And there's no drug on board. So it's a pure protracted seeking behavior under the control of stimuli in the environment, right? Interestingly, if you measure the level of responding these rats display under a fixed interval 15 minutes, they are not presented to see as contingently. In just 15 minutes, they press. We have a magic number of 50 to 70 liver presses. And when we introduce these contingent presentations of the CS every 10 liver presses, and this is condition enforcement. The difference between the yellow and the pink bar here, the animals self administer light. And the magnitude of condition enforcement here is almost 100 liver presses. Okay? Interestingly, when this model has been developed by Mercedes Arroyo in Barry's lab, with the help of Athena Marti, They've shown that if you take off the CS, the behavior goes down. And if you take off the drug, the behavior is not affected. So after well-trained, actually extended training, the behavior that is initially reinforced by the presentation of the drug becomes purely dependent upon the presentation of the CS. Okay? And so Barry of its group has proved the neural mechanisms that supported the acquisition of this behavior. So let's say in this behavior, there are instrumental responses. So you would predict the pain transmission in the ventral serum, acquisition of bold outlet behavior, dorsal middle serum as well. There are Pavlovian processes. So you would predict an involvement of the basolateral amygdala that supports the CS3 relationships. And that's exactly what they had. So if you vision the basolateral amygdala and you train the animals in increasing ratios in this procedure, so that they learn to the condition reinforcing properties of the CSs, the bilateral uh, BLA lesion rats can't acquire this task because it requires the Pavlovian properties of the CSs. So without the BLA, you don't have it. And interestingly, a lesion of the shell doesn't impair the acquisition of the task because the shell perhaps has more to do with titration or the pharmaceutical properties of the drug. But the lesion of the core markedly decreases the propensity to acquire this task. And uh, Pat Luciano performed a very interesting study, and she was interested in the dopamine and glutamate mechanisms taking place in the basolateral amygdala and the ventral cell and the core. And she performed initially, uh, she infused in these rats after short term exposure, uh, uh, aflatrupatic cell, D1, D2, or broad actually spectrum uh, dopamine antagonist. And she showed that there was no dependence, uh, there was no effect of dopamine blockade into uh, the core of the misacrement. But if you perform the same manipulations into the BLA, you will decrease the, uh, actually the performance of the control that's taking behavior. So there are dopamine components in the BLA that are necessary for this behavior to be expressed. But then that showed that if you were to block glutamate transmission in the core, you would decrease this behavior, whereas there was no implication of, of supposedly of glutamate transmission in the BL. So it suggests that two different neurotransmitters in two different structures that talk to each other a lot are involved in the acquisition of this performance. 
So then Pat moved on to a disconnection experiment. And I'm going to show you what disconnection experiments are all about, because we, I'm going then to discuss a lot about them. So let's say if we are interested in the striatum, and this is the shell, the core here, dorsal lateral striatum, and I want to show that both the ventral and the dorsal striatum play in a serial fashion to implement, actually to process a behavior. I have first to show that a bilateral manipulation of my first structure abolishes the behavior. My first structure is necessary for the behavior to be expressed. Okay? Then I have to show that the bilateral manipulation of my second structure also abolishes the behavior. Now, if my two structures process subparts of the same mechanism, but the fact that it's not a serial process, if I was to lesion the first structure on one side of the brain and the other structure on the other side of the brain, this function here would be maintained and this function here would be maintained and I wouldn't have any behavior impairment, right? Now, if the product of structure A is the substrate of structure B to process the behavior, then by doing this manipulation, I lose the substrate of structure B on that side of, that side of the brain, so I can't process the behavior and then I lose the endpoints on the other side of the brain. So I can't process the behavior. So this asymmetrical manipulation should have the same behavioral effect as either bilateral manipulation of this structure. Okay? And what Pat did was exactly this. So she showed that the high call, the high call in the amygdala occupants have no effect. The pain antagonists on, uh, on, in the BLA on one side of the brain had no effect because the other side of the brain was here to support the behavior. The same thing with blockade of glutamate transmission in the core on this side of the brain, but these two manipulations, which are not effective on their own, combined dramatically decrease cocaine seeking behavior. So, for the acquisition of the skew control cocaine seeking behavior, you need both the pain transmission to the BLA and glutamate transmission to the nucleus core. This is the first, actually, network that supports early cocaine seeking behavior. But then Rutsuko Ito in Barry's lab has shown that if you were to train these animals not for 10 days, but for 30 days in this task, actually with microdialysis, you could demonstrate that upon contingent presentation of the CSCs, there's an increased dopamine expressive synaptic levels in the dorsal artery. And this increase only appears when the animals receive the CS contingently. Because if you were to impose non-contingent presentation of the CS is here or here, there's no effect on the brain transmission. So it's not the light per se that triggers this increase of brain transmission, it's receiving the light when you've pressed for it. Okay, this is a marker within the dorsal dorsal of condition enforcement that involves the And it fits very well with Ingovidum's results, or should I say Ingovidum's results fit very well with this initial study. Then, Luke van der Schoen in Cambridge or so demonstrated, in, instead of being for correlational analysis, he went for causal manipulations of the brain, and he showed that if you were to block the pain transmission bilaterally into the dorsal testosterone of rats that have been performing the task for three weeks, you do dependently decrease cocaine seeking behavior prior to the first drug infusion. So, indeed, well established habitual to control cocaine seeking behavior depends upon the dorsal testosterone. And more precisely, you want the dopaminergic processes into this structure. And this fits well with the demonstration by Zapata that actually, when the animals have been trained for 40 days, the behavior is habitual. And if you were to inactivate the dorsal terrestrial in these animals that display habitual behavior, you make the behavior goal directed once again. <coughs> so, under the signal sugar enforcement procedure, you show that there is a recruitment of the pain processes into the dorsal system in conditions that match perfectly those of Zapata that has shown that the behavior at that stage is habitual. Though there's a marked difference between the two tasks. In this one, the seeking responses are not reinforced by the stimuli in the environment. And this is a major difference that I'm going to dig in now. So now, let's prove this new anatomy anatomical separation. If indeed the recruitment of dopamine processes into the dorsal artery 
that is under the control of the core of the nucleus accumbens, depends upon the circuitry, then you would predict that if you were to lesion the core of the nucleus accumbens on one side of the brain and block dopamine transmission into the dorsal arteriosteratum in the control arterial stratum, you would impair well-established control seeking behavior, but you would spare early onset control seeking behavior that doesn't depend upon the dorsal arteriosteratum, right? So this is a, a one of the first studies I did in Cambridge. And actually, a unitary lesion of the core didn't impair the acquisition of two-control toxicing behavior. Fair enough. One core in your brain is enough to support the behavior. Then when the behavior has been well established, after four weeks, I think, of, of training, so that's already 60 days of self-administration almost, a unilateral injection of aflatoxin into the dorsal arteriosteratum doesn't at all impair well-established two-control toxicing behavior because the intact side can support this behavior, right? If you combine these two manipulations, you end up with a marked dose-dependent decrease in cocaine-seeking behavior that is of the same magnitude as a bilateral blockade of dopamine transmission into the dose of the So indeed, two controlled drug-seeking behavior when they're well-established and they depend upon dopamine transmission into the dose of the this dopamine transmission depends upon the core. So there is an intracellular process that supports the instantiation of well-established true control toxicity behavior, okay? And interestingly, if you were to perform the same experiment in rats that have been trained only for 10 days on other task, there's no effect whatsoever of the disconnection, or there's no effect whatsoever of a bilateral blockade of the pain transmission into the DLS. Now, <clears throat> if we go back here, the pain transmission into the DLS depends upon the core. My feeling is that drug addicts display a synchronicity of ventral and dorsal cerebral dependent processes, such that the critic actor model of the basal ganglia doesn't work anymore. There's no critic. The ventral sphalum becomes only a pathway whereby impulses from the DLA reach the DLS. So that one impulse equals one response. And there's no antecedent treatment by the critic that is attributed to the core, or to the ventral sphalum, in promoting flexible behavior. This is only an hypothesis. Right. Interestingly, there's a ventral to dorsal shift but it would be nice if the theory was so simple. Goal-directed behavior don't depend solely upon the ventral cerebrum. They also depend upon the dorsal medial cerebrum. And more precisely, the posterior dorsal medial cerebrum. Yin has worked a lot on that. And generate, once again, probe whether when the two control seeking behavior become habitual, whether there was a shift from one to the other. So she performed bilateral cannulations of either the DMS or the DLS in these rats, and she's trained them over the course of the acquisition of this task. And after early onset training, she's shown that actually, you know, the pain blockade in the two in, of the dorsal arteriosteratum has no effect over seeking or taking. So she challenged the animals to seek the drug, but also to self administer the drug, right? There was no effect whatsoever. But when it was well established, the pain blockades of the dorsal arteriosteratum decreased cocaine taking behavior, whereas it has no effect on cocaine taking behavior. So you can dissociate the seeking responses from the taking responses. And the mirror was that when the behavior was goal directed, it was partly supported by the dorsal arteriosteratum, dorsal medial stratum, because blocking the pain transmission into this structure, those, those dependently decreased seeking responses. And when the behavior was well established, this structure was not involved anymore. So there's a transition from dorsal medial cerebrum to dorsal arterial cerebrum that parallels the transition from the ventral to the dorsal arterial cerebrum. Okay, so it's a complete transition from, come on. It's a complete transition from a goal-directed network involving the ventral cerebrum, the dorsal medial cerebrum, I haven't mentioned, but it's been shown that it also involves the orbitofrontal cortex. 
and the basal amygdala and its interplay with the pan-energic mechanisms into the mesonergic system. And when the behavior is well established, then there's a complete disengagement of the dorsal neosphere. The behavior depends upon the dorsal atmosphere and antecedent processes into the core of the nucleus accumbens. And I'll show you that it also depends upon the amygdala nuclei. Indeed, so there are, I think, intrastratal shifts that parallel psychological processes that shift from action outcome to stimulus response processes. And these intrastratal shifts, they must be triggered by something, right? And they just can't happen like this. So you could say drug exposure would be enough because if you have dopaminergic spillover outside the synapses in the ventral cerebellum because of the circuitry, you could recruit not adjacent synapses, but territories. So you could perhaps, because of sensitization of, of dopamine outflow, provide, actually trigger these kind of mechanisms. But psychologically, does it fit very well? Actually, the incentive habit theory I developed with Barry Everett suggests that perhaps it's the amygdala that drives the transitions. Why? So this theory put together the incentive habit theory of the Robinson, the allostasic theory of and the habit theory, suggesting that increased motivational value of CSCs by drug exposure depends partly upon CSUS relationships in the BLA and how the BLA drives the ventral sphere. And the incentive sensitization would also predict that the energy processes in the ventral sphere are enhanced, i.e., facilitating potential recruitment of adjacent synapses. The allostatic theory of addiction suggests that stimuli in the environment are not only related to the appetitive properties of the drug, but they're also related to the aversive properties of the drug. And the recruitment of the stress system through potentially the central nucleus of the amygdala and the DNST might also facilitate the sensitivity of the ventral cerebellum to pulverine influences, but also might drive specific adaptations into the dopaminergic neurons onto which the central nucleus projects massively, and specifically the neurons of the substance and agar combined. Okay, so we had the amygdala, the mesonic pathway, and obviously the dorsal atmosphere at play here. And if it's um, indeed the BLA, we have to come back to the psychological mechanisms subserving habitual cue control of seeking behavior. I mentioned to you that this task was very different from the seeking taking task. So this is ahead of an experiment we went through, actually, in which we probed in rats that had been trained to seek cocaine under the control of the CSUs. Over time, early on, intermediate training, late training, we've tested their sensitivity to dopamine receptor blockade into the DLS. While they were actively engaged into crew control seeking behavior, but also in sequences of, of the tasks, we tested their sensitivity to these manipulations where they are trained only to seek without the CSS. Okay? So they were trained for 15 minutes to give up press, but they did not receive the CSS. If what we are looking at now was purely a habit based behavior, you would predict that blocking the pain receptors into the dorsal vessel would blunt the responses in both cases. Because what you would affect is the instant response per se, right? Actually, you know, the evaluation has nothing to do with CSS. It has to do with the outcome and the instant response. What we had was early on, obviously, there's no effect of, of dopamine manipulations of the DLS. I've already shown, shown you this result several times. At intermediate stages of training, we tended to have an effect, some animals, are more vulnerable to develop habits than others. So obviously the transition to the DLS can happen faster in some animals than others. So we had this kind of hint that there was an effect here. And later on, obviously, we reproduce the effect that you completely abolish your control drug seeking behavior if you block the pain transmission to the DLS. Fair enough, we recapitulate all the results that I've already shown. Now, these animals have been challenge here and here only five days apart every time to make sure that you know the behavior matched perfectly and it was a Latin square so behavior here could not influence the one here and at every single stage 
what might strike you is there's no effect of dopamine blockade at all. Okay? And another aspect we wanted to probe here is perhaps the sensitivity to dopamine uh, manipulations of the DLS here has to do with the amount of behavior being more expressed as compared to here. So now if you compare the level of responding these animals display after well-established behavior, it's much higher than what they display here. Actually, it's twice as, as high as, as, as it used to be here. So when pre-controlled the ticking behavior becomes habitual, indeed, the instrumental responding because it becomes more effective or more efficient. They press more. So it's not sensitive to the pain blockade into the DLS. So the process we're looking at here is what I call an incentive habit. This is an instrumental response that is divorced from an outcome. We know this. But it's fed into, aberrantly, by Pavlovian properties coming from the amygdala. And the dopamine signal in the DLS is exactly it. Because if it was only habit, it would have the same effect as you have here. OK? So perhaps drug addiction has to do with this. And this, if this is the case, then the amygdala must be involved in driving this intracellular shift. Okay? So that's what we probed with Jen Murray and Odruna also. So these are unpublished results. Uh, we're just about to submit them. So Jen compared the bilateral manipulations of dopamine transmission in, into the DLS to a disconnection between the DLA and the DLS and a disconnection between the central nucleus of the amygdala and the DLS. Okay? Still, understanding that if you were to lesion one structure prior to drug exposure, you would tackle whether the question whether the structure is involved in neurological adaptations to drug exposure. So if you were to lesion the DLA, and the DLA is involved in the recruitment of DLS processes on that side of the brain, the lesion should impair this such that only a unilateral dopamine blockade would block the behavior, right? And actually, she, once again, reproduced previous results. Early on in training, blockade of dopamine receptors into the DLS has no effect whatsoever. And it, it's the case for the BLA DLS disconnection. It's the case for the central and DLS disconnection. Early on, the DLS is not involved in responding. The BLA is, for sure. But if we had blocked glutamate transmission here, it would have had an effect, because we know that at that stage of training, it's BLA core interactions that matter, right? Then at intermediate stage of training, we reproduce once again the fact that in some animals, the behavior has become to switch to DLS dependent processes. And actually, we had an interesting hint here that with BLA DLS disconnection, we have the same effect that we don't have with the central nucleus DLS disconnection here. Suggesting that if the central nucleus plays a role, its role is involved later on as compared to how the BLA is involved, which makes sense because the Pavlovian mechanisms supporting this shift are purely CSUS initially. And the engagement of the central nucleus might be in response to the recruitment of the stress system more than the Pavlovian processes per se, right? And at intermediate stage of uh, later stage of training, when the behavior is well established, once again, we end up with a dose dependent decrease in cocaine seeking behavior. When you block the pain transmission on both sides of the DLS, you've, you've seen that for 10 times now. But we have the same effects with the BLA manipulation and the same effects with the central nucleus of the amygdala manipulation. Yeah, you were right. The amygdala nuclei are necessary to recruit on this side of the brain the engagement of DLS dopamine dependent processes in ways that we should control the seeking behavior. The thing here is that this projects to this. The BLA projects massively to the central nucleus. And if the BLA has no direct projections whatsoever with the, to the dorsal atmosphere, the, the central nucleus projects massively to the substance and nigra compactor. So you could tell me, yeah, right now, you've lost your time, man, because the effect you have here can be exclusively attributable to this. Because that's one of the endpoints of the loop. And this is a highway. It's a central Nigra DLS pathway. 
three synapses. Yeah, three, two synapses, two synapses. Whereas here, it would be a BLA core, core loops, loops the LS pathway. How could we resolve this question? Actually, it took my wife and postdoc three years to go through this with electrophysiology. And I would consider that if indeed the BLA and the central nuclei of the amygdala drove these intracellular shifts through separate routes, we could probe the highways whereby the BLA can control the function of medium spinning neurons in the DLIs. And this pathway should be independent of the central. Okay? So what she did was in anesthetized rats, she used extracellular electrophysiology and she recorded medium spanning neurons in the DLS that she identified by stimulating the major glutamatergic input to this structure, which is the M1, motor cortex 1. And she set the probability of responding of these neurons to 50% so that we could see an upward or downward shift in the regulation of the activity of these neurons. And at the same time, she would implant a stimulating electrode into the BLA. And she would stimulate, if indeed the BLA can gauge the activity of these neurons, then she would stimulate the BLA prior to M1 stimulation and measure the effect of the BLA stimulation on the response probability of medium spray neurons to M1 stimulation. Is that clear for everyone? The classical gating experiments in electrophysiology. And interestingly, if you look here, this is, a pr I'm very sorry you don't see it, this is 50%. This is the probability of responding of these neurons prior to BLA stimulation, 50%, fair enough. Then a BLA stimulation alone, without M1 stimulation, doesn't trigger any action potential into the DLS. The DLA doesn't project massively to the DLS, actually it doesn't project at all, so you wouldn't expect any effect here. But then, if the BLA went through to the DLS through three synapses, you would expect that the BLA could control the activity of the medium spray neurons into the DLS with small latencies, inter-stimulation intervals, like between one and 20 milliseconds, let's say. And others tried one and five milliseconds and 50 milliseconds. At 50 milliseconds, there's a trend, but there's no effect whatsoever. But if you stimulate the BLA in the range of 100 to 300 milliseconds, then you can identify with cluster analysis three populations of neurons. Some neurons that reach almost 90% of response probability, some neurons that go down to 10% of response probability, and some neurons that are not affected. Don't ask me whether these ones are D1 or these ones are D2. That's the bet we do now, but we actually haven't probed it. Nevertheless, this shows that whatever happens, the BLA, which is a very old allocortex mammicara, exerts a control over the DLS, which is in the forebrain. And interestingly, this control is not time locked. It requires one to 300 you know, milliseconds. That fits perfectly with a multi synaptic route. But it doesn't tell you whether it got to the core or not. We don't know. So then what O did is, in the same rat, she put then another electrode in the core, and she injected a cocktail of AP5 and CN2X, whereby blocking completely glutamatergic processes into the core and the nuclear cumulus. And what she's shown is, looking this effect, actually, glutamate transmission in the core abolishes the effect of the stimulation on the response probability of neurons and neurons into the DLS to M1. So the effect that the BLA exerts over the DLS requires the core. And the core doesn't project to the central and doesn't receive any projections for the central. I think for that, the BLA can control the dorsal arterial through a multi synaptic code that depends upon the code. And behaviorally, here, and I've just shown you that the mechanisms that were involved by these structures were dependent independent into the DLS. There's, according to what the current knowledge, only one route whereby dopamine processes in the dorsal cerebellum can be different from the core. It's the nigro, it's a nigro strato loop. Uh, I think I should stop now. No?
Okay, okay, can you go on? You can find the Perfect. Form. So, I hope I've just demonstrated to you that this is classic self-administration. It involves the VLA because there's always a CS in the box. It involves domain transmission into the shell and the corner of the equivalence of the total cortex, primary and primary cortices. But if you train animals to seek a chain for protected periods of time, then you would switch all this to a central VLA core magra VLS pattern. Obviously, the experiment we're going to run now is to use the dreads and optogenetic tools to actually specifically address this pathway. Because the conclusions I drew from the previous slide was an indirect conclusion. So we want to probe that pathway. Anyway, overall, there's a transition neurobiologically that accompanies the psychological transition. So now, the behavior is dependent upon the DLS. What could be the mechanisms that support it? Cellular. Interestingly, Jeff mentioned that in the monkey studies, people usually probe the dopamine transporter protein. And there's, in rats or in monkeys, a decrease in dopamine transporter levels. And dopamine transporters in the strelum aren't expressed on your neurons. They're also expressed on astrocytes. And they support different functions. If the dopamine transporter at the synapse is here to buffer the pain release and to actually support the on-off signal of dopamine, the pain on astrocytes are here to buffer the extrasynaptic dopamine. And Maxim Krusak in Poitiers has shown that here in white is the level of dopamine transporter into the anterior posterior dorsolateral serum, anterior posterior dorsomedial serum, and nucleus accumbens of animals that have been trained for four weeks to seek a cane under the control of, of stimuli in the environment. And it's shown that there is indeed a decrease in the pain transporter. And how did he do that? He took these rats' brains, punched the DLS, and run through a Western blood the samples. And this decrease is relative to food controls or drug native animals. Fair enough, you can reproduce the literature. But then, if actually from the same rats, instead of crunching the brains, you select the astrocytes and you culture them, you can observe that in astrocytes from the protein exposed group, there's a complete, complete blend of the pain transport expression. We haven't yet processed whether this can account for all of this, but we just ran an experiment showing that this decrease in the pain transport expression in astrocytes occurs already after 10 days of the expression. So it might contribute to the instantiation of intrastellar shifts. Obviously, if there's nothing outside the synapse to take dopamine back when you take cocaine, you've got a striatum that is bathed by cocaine. So perhaps, if addiction is indeed a disease, of corticosteroidal secretory, if you will, it doesn't necessarily only involve neurons. And especially, even the dopaminergic processes don't necessarily involve neurons. Do you want a couple of words about impulsivity and striatal shifts? Or is it over? It's over? Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. So, um, yeah. under the second shield of enforcement, if you measure dopamine levels, you from drug infusion, there's a massive increase in the core the shell. But when they seek for cocaine for these 15 minutes, there's nothing. Tell me if I'm wrong, Jeff, because Jeff was involved in the study. So. Is, that's it. Yeah. So, indeed, you know, you don't, the, the dopaminergic signal 
DuPont drug delivery doesn't disappear. But these are two different processes. Self-administering cocaine under a fixed ratio schedule triggers dopamine transmission all the time in the ventral cerebellum. And there's a hint also in the DLS. But seeking for the drug doesn't trigger these responses in the ventral cerebellum. It's more glutamate processes, glutamatergic processes in the ventral cerebellum that are involved. Obviously because they're hippocampus and the DLA and the frontal cortex sent glutamate projections. But if you block the one receptors in the hippocampus score, you get rid of Draxin. Oh, sorry. Yeah, copy the Draxin to copy the system, right? Under this procedure? Yeah, that's my question. Actually. But other procedure, but you seeking under So Yamin Chan's procedure is the psychological equivalent of our first day of acquisition. Sorry. Yavin Chan's reinstatement procedure is the psychological equivalent of the very first day of acquisition of our rats. Because the um, so to, to picture what happens in the in the extension reinstatement model, or may it be the ABA model if you will. What self administer for 12 days? So we know there's no replacement of DLS processes whatsoever. They self administer for 12 days. Then they go under extinction. And then eventually, they are presented in the box with the liver, the CS, but not the drug, for 20 minutes. Under the second under enforcement, the animals have been in the box every day for three hours pressing the liver for the life with no drug for 15 minutes at a time, getting water and infusions after 15 minutes, and do it again and again and again. So the, the reinstatement procedure, the way it's been performed so far, is an acquisition of conditional reinforcement. It is the very first time the rats ever end up in a situation where they press for, not for, for the CS, but not the drug. So if you, if you wanted to compare to what we've done, it's the very first day of training. So actually, to train these animals up to this level of responding, we first train them under, under FR1, because they have they require the contingencies to understand that the person needs to do the exposure. So for three days or five days, they're trained under FR1. And then we switch from ratio to interval schedules of enforcement for eight days. So first day, fixed interval, one minute, two minutes, four, eight, 10, three days of fixed interval 15 minutes so that we have the baseline of responding without condition enforcement. And then we introduce the CS, you can tense liver presses. So from that day on, then they are trained for 40 days. So the inspection and statement model would be that day. And it is actually exactly, it fits exactly with the figure we have. Come on. Because ah. here the animals have been self administering cocaine on the fixed ratio one for 10 days, and we challenge them with a single station of 15 minutes to seek cocaine with the CS presented every liver press, and they would receive the cocaine on the new point. The first liver press after 15 minutes have elapsed. This is the reinstatement procedure. And this is a difference level of behavior between these two. Here, they will press 200 times in 15 minutes for nothing. So we can discuss about breaking point now. Um, the break point was introduced by Odos in 1961 for milk. And obviously, you know, when you work for milk, having milk or having no milk won't impact onto the instrumental output subsequently. 
And the break, actually the breakpoint to pricing ratio is based on behavioral economics. So more work is required to get the same reward. How much are you willing to go for to get a reward? Now, if you have rats that press 200 times for 15 minutes for nothing, what would be the first ratio you would go for? If we, if we take a, uh, the, the classical asymptotic model of the work point, they never stop. They just never stop. And it's even worse, because once they have the drug on board after five infusions, they go up asymptotically. So we had, you know, in the three quartile model, with Veronique and, and Pierre, we had developed a, a pretty ratio schedule, which is much, much stiffer. Actually, to get to the sixth infusion, they have to press 2,000 times. But you know, the three quartile model. These are rats. Huh? Yeah, these are rats. But the three quartile rats would go up to, actually, my rats would go up to 20,000 liver presses in five hours. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're, but they are only 15% of the population that is trained. So, in that case, the. the yeah, in five hours, in yeah. five hours. But for breakpoints of 16. So it's, you know, it's much more difficult for them to reach that stage. But here, so we've, tr we've tried them, actually. Um, I have implemented in, in, in my lab a, mo a three quartile model. So probing drug-seeking behavior, high motivation for the drug. And we now punish these animals when they seek the drug. Interestingly, if you, if you expose rats to extended access to cocaine for three weeks and you punish them with a schedule uh, we use in the three quartile model. So the punishment is the animals are turned on the FR5, they press once that day, and there's a little light flashing saying, hey, hey, you're gonna hurt today, hmm. okay? And then if I press three more times, i.e. reaching FR4, they receive one shock. And if within a minute they press a fifth time, i.e. reaching the full requirement, they receive another shock, and then they receive the drug. So in the 2004 science paper we have with Pierre, and I did not want to discuss much about that today because Pierre is going to discuss about that tomorrow. And the 2008 paper we had with Jeff, we have 20% of the animals that are willing to go through these shocks and actually get their, their drug. If you were to apply the same procedure to rats that have escalated cocaine for three weeks, they all stop. They all stop. So the, what we call compulsivity after escalation is based on the probabilistic punishment procedure. Either I have cocaine or I receive a shock. This is gambling. So I can show you some write-ups about that. Um, Wait. Here we are. So here we were interested in, in uh, glutamatergic processes in the dorsal cell, knowing that you know after escalation you should recruit the pain processes in the dorsal cell. So we have rats that do escalate nicely. This is the work by Michael Pou and Eric Ducré. So that's the overall intake. They escalate well. Short access rats. They don't escalate much. And this is the intake for the first hour. So indeed, escalation works in my lab. Fair enough. Then, actually, after three weeks of training, we have injected half the animals with n acetal cysteine every day. And we wanted to check whether n acetal cysteine decreased loss of control when it is established. Because the previous studies have treated the animals straight away. So you're not addicted already, but I give you a treatment, and I see whether you're going to develop addiction. Uh, and actually, n acetal cysteine does nothing to escalation. It does nothing to motivation. Even though, actually, the long access guys are much more motivated than the short access guys. And I would say, this is how we sell it. But I would disagree with this. Because if you press 200 times per day, and you're challenged with the same procedure as a guy that presses 50 times per day, obviously, the daily output is different. If you train every day to press 200 times, it's not an effort to press 200 times, is it? When you press every day 50 times, you have to press four times more when you challenge under a pressing ratio schedule enforcement. So now we, we consider the baseline level of responding as a way to normalize the level in pressing ratio. Anyway, what's interesting is that these guys have been self administering cocaine six hours per day, 200 infusions, like they're, they're full of crack. We finish them, that's what happens, two infusions. 
two infusions. Okay? Interestingly, if you stop finishing them, an acetylcysteine may help them maintaining the kind of restored control that doesn't occur in the short excess gas. But if we were to contrast these results to just in a second to these ones. So this model has been my life in Pierre Lucas's lab for three years. I slept in the lab for a year. Um, we have rats f to control two hours a half per day, FR5. And after 70 to 80 days of self administration, we challenge them with the policy ratio schedule, and we challenge them with the same punishment procedure I showed you. And actually, 20% of the population show no suppression whatsoever. <coughs> they don't escalate. They don't differ. I think it's just after. Um, they don't differ in their, sorry, in their intake. They take the same amount of drug. And eventually, you ask them, do you want it more? Are you willing to get punished to get it? 40 to 60% of the rats, the white guys here, they take the same amount every day. And they tell you, huh, no, I don't go for it. 20% of the guys, the green guys here, they go for it. And there are marked differences between these guys, but Piazza will discuss about that tomorrow. And he, he had very nice follow-up studies showing that the three quarter rats here display impaired synaptic plasticity in the ventral surgery. But uh, so actually, this is very interesting. The same exposure to the drug, pre-existing differences, a different behavior. And impulsivity has been shown to predict, not this, impulsive rats self administer cocaine at the same rate as non-impulsive rats, except when they're given external access. But they switch from recursion of drug use to compulsivity. If you punish them, they don't care, they go for it. And actually they even develop strategies when they, there's, there's this little light flashing, they say, ah, it's gonna hurt, I'm gonna jump. And they jump on the lever. <laughs> so they don't lever press with their paws anymore, they just jump on the lever. Eventually, the lever gets retracted when they get the, the, the cocaine infusion, so they get shocked anyway, but actually they learn just to jump. That's, it's amazing, but they go for it. So impulsivity predicts not the initiation of drug use, not the rate under fixed ratio, which is linearly dependent upon the unit bolus of the drug, it predicts the transition to complexity. And this is a major difference between these two. Here it shows you that the differential access to the drug doesn't predict complexity. But the interaction between the same access to the drug and in interindividual differences that predict complexity, then if you test these animals for six hours per day, after we have identified the zoo, the compulsive guys escalate. So escalation can be a consequence of the same exposure to the drug, but interacting with internal differences. And this reconciliates very well Jeff's results. High impulsivity rats are not more prone to acquire drug administration, but they are prone to develop compulsivity, and they escalate more. <coughs> So we've done this experiment with Craig. So all, all, all the time with upgrades, right? So it, it works with Craig, no smoking. It works with Vister Hooded, no smoking. It works with Vister Hooded, press, liver pressing, Craig liver pressing. We have always the same, same features. Yeah. So, so, so the shift between the, from the ventral striatum to the dorsal lateral striatum, um, do you think that's recruitment of indirect or direct pathway? Uh, how does that fit into to this, this, this model? That's an excellent question. Actually, we are stuck with a couple of results that are unpublished yet because we can't understand them. I've shown you that if you were to inject FFU early on in training into the DLS, there's no behavioral effect whatsoever, right? And if you inject it when the behavior is well established, you completely abolish the response. So first of all, we wanted to probe whether D1 or D2 receptors were potentially involved in there. So we actually, I carried out this, re this experiment, and it was the very last one I did in Cambridge before I established my lab in France. And the results were so weird that for the first time in my life, I thought I did something wrong, 
So then I took a postdoc to do the experiment while I was away, and she ended up with, uh, not, not telling her that I had done the experiment, and she had exactly the same result. What we have is if we inject the D2 receptor antagonist early on in training, you decrease pure control that's seeking behavior, and later on in training, you decrease pure control that's seeking behavior. The D1 receptor antagonist, early on you have no effect on behavior, later on there's a major effect. How can you expect that by blocking the two receptors at the same time, it's alpha frequency pixel, you have no effect early on, whereas by blocking only the two receptors, you have an effect? My only interpretation of this data, and it's purely speculative, and we haven't published it because we're still investigating it, is that early on, D1 and actually the direct and indirect pathways work in an opposite fashion, and later on, they are synchronized. There's no other explanation. Right now, if you have one, I buy it. But there, there's no other explanation. So I can't tell you now, and you know, and we, we were limited, so these are very sophisticated behaviors, and we've invested a lot in establishing them. Now, now they're well established, we're going to invest, like Jeff, into these new tools that can really cleanly probe one pathway and another. With pharmacology, you always end up with contrast and indirect conclusions, but we're going to use the dreads to know what's gonna happen. And we're going to use the dreads to probe what is necessary to recruit the system, and ontogenetics to probe what is necessary for condition reinforcement to support the behavior. So two different strategies. Yeah. Do you think you might have an effect as well on the D2 insulinergic interneurons and then it's more difficult to dissect the role of the That's That's an excellent question. And actually, we're lucky in Cambridge to have some transgenic rats that will help us teasing apart the question. Yeah, you're right. It might come from it. Or even you know, D2 on some interneurons okay. that are not cholinergic. You're absolutely right. I don't remember the specifics of the behavior a bunch that came out of the paper a year ago about yeah. how decreasing activity in the cortex. Yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the primary cortex, the region in the brain that is uh, the most important to pro actually to monitor pain. And when you play with compulsivity, you have to make sure that what you're measuring has nothing to do with the threshold in pain sensitivity, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we've discussed with Andrew about that. It's a beautiful paper. And it's a lot of work. But the obvious control is missing. I don't know whether re actually reactivating the prenatal core pathway changes pain sensitivity or not. Why am I telling you this? So this is a very provocative set of results that actually I was kicked out of France because of this. Because influential people didn't like it. Okay? And they sued me for making up this data. We're clean. We did not make that We were interested in the effect of environmental on environmental enrichment on drug addiction. We discussed, you know, genes, vulnerability. So we discussed about a lot of self administration, but here is the effect of the environment. What you knew and what we all knew was environmental enrichment decreases self administration early on in training. And this has been considered to be a marker of protection against addiction. Even though, as Raphael mentioned, the titration hypothesis suggests that if you self administer less on the fixed ratio, the unit dose of cocaine is more rewarding. Right? Nevertheless, this is known, and we can reproduce this data. But then, if you train these animals for 70 days and you challenge them with the motivation and everything I've just told you, actually, we ended up with this addiction score with rats that display none of the addiction criteria, rats that display all the addiction like criteria, so the experiment works, and this is what we have. Most of the guys that resist to addiction come from the standard conditions. All the guys that display the addiction of behavior come from the enriched environment. And this is driven mostly, if you look at this, is a polar chart showing the Z scores for each of these dimensions. There's no much effect on motivation. There's an, a robust effect on persistence of drug seeking, but there's a major effect on compulsivity. The obvious control was, does the neutral environment change pain sensitivity? Because if it does, we're dead. 
it doesn't. And we measure the behavior on the hot plate procedure and with one for each element procedure. More interestingly, we just finished an experiment with herring. I've, I've been craving to develop this model for herring, because right now it's only being developed for cocaine. How can you measure compressivity with herring when it is an analgesic? Tell me. It took us four years. Yeah, so but the point is, you play with the pain threshold. So how can you make sure that a shift in the resistance to punishment is independent of any shift in the pain threshold? You don't give the drug. Okay, so we've trained rats in the second order sugar reinforcement procedure, and we've performed exactly the same experiment. Interestingly, if you monitor the resistance to punishment during the first interval, so prior to drug exposure, there's no relationship whatsoever between compressive and taking behavior and pain sensitivity. Every single behavior that occurs after the first drug infusion is 90% correlated to pain sensitivity. So heroin seeking and compressive and seeking is not related to pain sensitivity in our hands, but even one shot of heroin changes everything. And we've actually, we had to dissociate the seeking responses and play with compressive seeking from self administration per se, so that we, make, we made sure that the behavior wasn't contaminated by drug induced effects on can it be an up or low of, of downward shift, allodynia or tolerance to pain sensitivity? We had to make sure that we could see the problem. So every measure of compressivity has to come alongside the measure of pain threshold, especially when you play with structures in the brain, such as the primary cortex that have been shown to fine-tune pain sensitivity. It's Anton's paper is a great paper, and this is one of those I wish I had done as well. But uh, no, I just I can't tell you more than this. And the other aspect, if you just may ask, Anton used Jan Pelou's model in a seeking-taking task in which you would punish probabilistically. So in that task, the animals know that either they have their drug or they get punished. This is gambling. Actually, if you end up with a, with a more risk-prone phenotype that has nothing to do with compulsivity, you might end up going for the, for the drug, because, that, because that's gambling. And in the same procedure, if you apply the punishment procedure I told you about, they all suppress. So I'm very glad, because I think we carry were the first ones ready to out work outcome on compulsivity. I'm glad, big glad, like Anto. Work on it. But mind you, compressivity is everything. And when you establish models, you really have to understand what you're measuring. Pun introducing punishment in a procedure, it doesn't guarantee you that you're measuring compressivity. So actually, what Barry did with the was was uh, they measured the, the strength of fear conditioning with the intensities of shock they used. Mm. And they showed that there was no shift in the strength of conditioning, i.e., then was felt the shock the same way. Yeah, if they were differently sensitive, you would expect different fear responses. Well, you know, anxiety, there are so many factors there. Yeah. So what, what, what do you do suggest? Yeah. No, because in order, you suggest in order to, 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 because of course this is a, a polemic result, that, that, that's for sure. But in order to, be, and, and, and in the hot play, while well, you have this very small ten, trend that you can see in the, in the figure, no? So somebody that will be critical will, will say, well, to modify hot, hot plate threshold, you need you need morphine with with a, with a, with a, um, with a, most of an analgesic compound that are used in clinic. You are not able to modify. I actually, plate. with with uh, so with the signal shadow enforcement, with only five infusions of heroin per day, after mm -hmm. five days you change the threshold. You change the, mm -hmm. already. 
Yeah. Mm. So, but I agree with you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Still, it, I think it's important. Yeah, yeah. And actually, and the effect of primary cortex on fine tuning pain has been done with with in the output. Mm. Mm. Like, You're right. Then, actually, we, we've been through these kind of discussions in Cambridge for, actually, for a long time. There's no perfect control, because yeah. we know that if there was an effect of the exposure on pain sensitivity, it might be somehow conditioned to the context as well. Mm -hmm. So you might have to measure pain sensitivity in the young yeah. chamber, yeah. which makes, actually, yeah. then it's, it's a mess. But I agree with you, actually. That, yeah. But nevertheless, I think this is still important to show yeah, yeah. that there's no relationship. Because even though there's, at the between subject design, there's no major differences at the individual level. The variance is, is wide. Mm -hmm. It's very wide. So when you're interested in inter-individual differences, and actually you have a correlation, you could have, you can have a correlation without between subject differences. Mm -hmm. and actually, we don't have it. So, but I agree with you. Yeah. I need to ask this question. I'm afraid I can't resist. I want to go back to the, the video of the drunk that was by the road that undertook this rather absurd behaviour of drinking from a breathalyzer. <laughs> and then next to that, you showed Nora's beautiful paper that was published in the Journal of Neuroscience. That was a, a PET study showing displacement of the tracer. So, in other words, there was more dopamine being released in that region. What I couldn't quite figure out was the relationship between the video and the rise in dopamine to a stimulus in terms of, for example, error prediction, that there was no cocaine, therefore the error prediction was large, therefore more dopamine, to what that person by the side of the road actually did in terms of an action that was rather absurd. How does it relate to perhaps... So if, if you want to go to error prediction, actually we had this discussion with Val Ram Schultz two weeks ago. Um, when I mentioned that I thought that in drug addiction the critic didn't exist, and the synchronicity between the control and the dosor sphere explained the behavior, I think that's exactly what we had in, in the video. There's a stimulus. There's no way to take into consideration alternatives, or it's just the stimulus drives one action that has been pre-existing, actually that is pre-existing, which is, I go for it, without, without antecedent treatment by the motor trailer. So the stimulus and its features triggers this impulse that goes through the motor trailer with no treatment. So not action prediction errors, nothing. It goes to the SR system. And what I, w I suggested was, if I wanted to relate this to Nora's work is, this is dopamine increase in the dosage system. This guy, I'm not sure, didn't, yeah, I'm sure he didn't crave. And I would predict that if Noah was to give addicts cocaine in the PET scan, if she could ethically do it, he would have this increase in dopamine transmission to the DLS. The guy would take the drug, he would have no craving. What I was challenging was the video actually shows someone who's relapsing, who's taking drug, and I'm sure there was crazy team craving because it really looks like a reflex. And if you really want to make sure that the claim that dopamine transmission in the dosage system is related to craving, you have to show that if you were to give the drug, i.e. facilitating the full sequence of behavior, you would have the same result. And I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure, it's a personal conviction, that craving occurs only when the people are at, on the verge of relapsing and the drug is not there. I think there's little craving if there's a drug in the vicinity. from the Brain Imaging Center in um, Germany. In, 
I'm not sure about one. Uh, they've shown, so they've played with nicotine addicts and aptens. And so these nicotine addicts have to play with a joystick to go away from drug cues. And depending whether the cues represented something that was distal or proximal to them, they couldn't go away from them. So if you're presented with a pack of cigarettes and you're a nicotine addict, you can take the joystick towards you, so away from the pack of cigarettes. Now you're presented with a cigarette that is not light, you start struggling. If you're presented with a cigarette that is lit just before you, you just go for it. You, just, you, you can't go away from the stimulus. And they are not under the effects of the drug. These are very interesting results. You know, playing with going towards, approaching the stimulus, or controlling your approach and going away from the stimulus. If the stimulus gets closer to you, you, you struggle more and more. Yeah. And, it, and they showed in this set of studies that um, actually the more, the, the closer the stimulus could be, the more your somatosensory cortex and your insular involved than the orbital cortex. So you really go for prepotent behavioral patterns. So I would, I would speculate that you would have behaved the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Perhaps, you know, this guy he looks near like the Corsac of Single. I think it's, it's pretty, if I may say, it's pretty fast large. So. Thank you very much. Have you got a ticket for the lunch? Anybody missing? Thank you very much.